Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to our EPC meeting. Um, we are missing two individuals, but we still have the required number, right? With Gregory, Ken, and myself. That's correct. And Suni emailed yesterday and said that she wouldn't be able to make it, so she's got an excused absence. Okay. Um, so I guess we'll, the meeting's called to order. Greg's participating remotely. And while we're doing the roll call, I know that I've got committee member Frederick Harrell and committee member Lowe. I think it's um, prompt that at this point we can um, vacate Min Hui's seat and begin advertising to replace it. I'll send her an email to inform her of this. If she has a change of mind or a change of heart, um, I'll suggest that she consider reapplying because I think at this point we should you know, recruit for somebody that has the time and an interest in serving. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Min Hui was indicated interest months ago, and I know she communicated with Rachel Launder back then but she um, has not attended any of our meetings. So uh, there, there could be something wrong. She could move. So maybe we email her just in full transparency to yeah. let her know. You know, we'd love to have her participate, but if she's not able, if we don't hear back from her, maybe we give her a week. And if we don't hear back from her, we just say we'll open up the position on the website to well, someone else. I did that last time. Oh, you did? Yeah. So, so. now it's been at least three months. Yeah, it's been, it's okay. been a while. Again, I'll send her another email. I won't advertise until maybe next week, Friday. We'll con we'll consider it kind of open right now. So if you have people that you think might be interested, let's talk to them. But I'll wait until next Friday before I fully put it out to the community and, and we start recruiting. Is there a process, like a formal process? If the someone formal just process show? really is two unexcused absences. We can consider the seat vacated. Okay. Staff will communicate that and then we can move forward. But we've, we've already reached that. Point. Okay. Um, I'll note that there were no public comments before the meeting, and I don't see anybody joining online other than Greg, and there's no one in the room, so um, no public comments. I do want to take an opportunity to make sure that the committee gets introduced to Malara. So Malara is our city manager intern. We have four this time around. I can just give you a little brief background on our little internship program with Atherton. When I got here in 2019, we didn't have any for a while. Um, Council member Widmer was a proponent of it. And I said, sure, I'll take college kids. And of course, in that vein, he gave me a high school kid. And that high school kid turned out to be the current board member for a Sequoia Union High School district and getting his master's at Stanford. So it makes me look like a fool for not saying I like high school kids, but I'm telling <laughs> you, he was just a diamond, like our Asian A, right? But this summer, um, we had a lot of interest in our internship program, and what we ended up getting is a lot of people from out of the state and kids who are going to be returning to the area. So instead of our traditional six month to a year program, I decided to shorten those and then bring in four summer interns so it still meets our budget, but we just have more youth and people who can participate, and Malara is one of those folks. She'll be leaving us, though, in August because she starts at Berkeley. Um, so we'll lose her pretty soon. Are we adding more in August then or what? I'm taking that into consideration. I'll talk to my city manager about that. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for spending time with us. And if you want to sit down and grab a cup of coffee or talk about your career path and interests and how we can support you with your career, just let us know. Anthony, before you leave off the interns, I would like to make a plea as a member of the committee. It'd be nice to have an intern available to us to use to do some research at times because we don't have the time to do it sometimes and the right intern particularly with a data analytics background would be very valuable so the intern program that i oversee is a paid internship for the town we use them in the city manager's office and i trust me they do a lot of work to create an intern program that would report directly to the epc i think it's something like what rachel worked for no, with asian and i think that worked good but i i'll tell you this there's no rule that says, as a committee, we can't look for, seek out someone that serves the EPC exclusively. Um, I just don't know how much bandwidth I have to add that on right now. I, I would be willing to right. help with that because yeah. I've been toying with the idea. I've had a lot of students um, that are you know, really articulate, hardworking, yeah. who've asked for summer internships. And since we had the policy that we don't take high school kids, I had to say sorry, and they they didn't want to be paid, and and I don't mind do being the person who signs off with right. their professors and stuff. So I was going to try to do something about that, and we have this youth group, this youth advisory group, which really didn't get off the ground last year. The one but, led by the Fiona Lempris. Yes. Yep. 
but I, there's renewed interest. There's a bunch of other kids that sent in. So I would like to take a more active role in yeah. making that happen. So maybe the so, three of us can get together outside of this meeting yeah, and talk about I wanna, that. I want to reach okay. out to high school Before kids. Before you lose the train of thought, the real question for me is, what would they do? That, and that's exactly why what I'm saying. For me, like working with an intern, even if they're as sharp as Malara, there's time invested from the staff, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so... Well, I, I don't know that I have that to commit in the next yeah. six months. Well, I will say that when I ran for office, which I'm not saying about that, but I did have the students do research because you have to do position papers and you have to <clears> take <throat> positions. And the kids on the environmental stuff were phenomenal. I gave them like go to the San Mateo County sustainability website and find out, you know, what you know, they did research like that and they're academic. They know how to use the internet. They were able to pull together some really good stuff for me. And some of which I almost used verbatim what they gave me. But, but I'm, I'm looking so. for the next level down research. As far as if we do this, what's, it, what's impact does it really have? You can talk about the big numbers and all the rest, but in our town, if we do the following, what impact does it have? And that takes real research, not going to the county websites and all that stuff. It's doing some data analysis. Well, I would suggest that we have an, a separate meeting on the idea of an intern. Yep. And I see that we could have an intern where part of what their internship is Earth Day, because that's where we get our, we have 50, you know, over the years we've had averaged 50 uh, volunteers, all high school kids. So why don't we offer a more formal internship that involves attending maybe one or two of these sessions? I know they're in the middle of the day, so they're hard for kids but we can figure out a program of what they do. We can give them assigned topics to research for us, and then they participate in Earth Day. So we could formalize that as an internship and they can maybe get class credit for it, a sustainability professor may sponsor it, or simply service hours like they do with Earth Day now. But why not, I'd like to propose that we do some, we have a discussion about that, and is that something we wanna do, and what would it, we could use them to help us with? Just to interject, so I have experience with eight interns from Menlo College this summer. Um, my suggestion is to have, a, it, it requires a tremendous amount of oversight. So I don't want an intern personally. I don't have time to manage an intern. So I would say if there's interest in having an intern, um, it would not be someone who would report to me. Ken, if you want an intern, that's fine, but no, 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 I'm, it's I'm not, tremendous responsibility. I'm not looking for that. No. Okay. Um, the, the other thing I would say at Menlo College, if we were to pursue relationships there, there's a formal program through the Career Center um, in exchange for working with um, a company, a nonprofit organization, they get credit that needs to align with a class they're taking and with a professor that they have. So, um, and of we course- We have one of those this summer. You do, okay. So that's um, formalized because there's also an onboarding process through Handshake. There is um, an evaluation form that's filled out a midway through the internship and at the end, and it impacts whether or not they get credit. So again, it really does take oversight and they actually have to be able to report back to their professor the projects that they're working on and they have to be at college level. Um, they have to so, have a minimum number of hours. For yes, that. and there's hours involved. They have 30% of their student body is international. There's an INT 399, which is a special type of visa that allows those students to actually work and get paid. Um, I don't know how it works with working in government, that a foreign student, that could be trickier. So I don't know what the rules are, but I guess the point is that my experience is it's a tremendous amount of oversight. So um, I don't know that I would have the time to take on an intern personally. When, when I did it with the kids, it was a lot easier than that. The teachers, I literally at the end, same as when we use them on Earth Day, I literally at the end just signed, yes, they did these hours. That was it. And I gave them assignments and then they would yeah. mail me the stuff, the teacher. There was no oversight. Many of the high school programs are a lot less formal than this particular yeah, yeah. one at Menlo yeah, this, College. It was really easy. I didn't Theirs have is a part much. of their graduation requirement. Yeah, so they, yeah. They have yeah. to. The summer program. Yeah, it's the like summer a cooperative. Program, um, 28 hours per week for 10 weeks required between junior and senior year. I think that's a great idea for summer. We can get them throughout the year and it's high quality work. So I guess the question is what type of engagement, what type of student, 
high school students, in my experience, are not going to be able to perform at the same level, except we have had some exceptions right. with H&E for sure. But um, again, if you want high quality research and work and you have not only the student, but you can align with that professor, it also serves a purpose in getting us closer to mental college, which I think we all want to do. Yep. So um, anyway, I would move that in that direction unless we had an outstanding high school senior who wanted to do, you know, some work alongside their environmental studies class or something like that. I think, and I think we've kind of jumped to six, our priorities and goals. Um, so we can continue that maybe once we get through the rest of the agenda and if necessary, maybe have like a little separate meeting because you guys could do somewhat of a subcommittee mm -hmm. or something. So you may not have had an opportunity to take a look at the minutes. I don't know. We added them late to the agenda. <clears throat> if you'd like, we can table that to the next meeting to vote um, if unless, but it's really just the minutes and I can pull them up on the screen if you all would like. Yeah, and, let's do that. Yeah. That way we can look so quickly. Recap. Is just a recap of our last meeting. Give me one moment. I'll do that. Very brief recap. Going to share screen. Bring up here. So, last meeting we called it to order. Um, yeah, there's an edit that needs to be done. Rachel wasn't here. Uh, we did an Earth Day recap where we all discussed, you know, our pros and cons best practices. We came up with a recommendation of what we'd like to have go to the city council, both from the EPC perspective and from the staff perspective. Um, and we'll talk a bit about that on today's agenda. We had a discussion on community engagement outreach activities where we talked a little bit about what we want to do, what we want to see, what things we want to focus on, which is going to be a bigger part of today's conversation. Um, no formal action was taken, nor was a consensus reached. So that's why that's reappearing on this agenda. Um, then we went on to our committee and staff reports. Committee member Frederick talked a little bit about his interest in encouraging our town vendors to consider sustainable technology tools. And so that's going to be actual formal item on today's uh, agenda for us to take some, some action on. Uh, there were no other subcommittee updates. Uh, and that was it. The bulk of that was... Um, Earth Day, no, sorry. And then future agenda topics, which again is part of today's conversation. The three here represented what the staff thought were um, of interest and the committee didn't seem to object it to any of them. So we are gonna talk about today's, our goals, our missions, our priorities. Uh, Christabel will provide a bit of a reach code update about where the council's at. And then we have a, a PowerPoint that we can share and put up on the screen that the council saw in February. It's very complex, it's very detailed. It's got um, this thing called an energy performance um, method and nobody here is an expert, but we'll do our best to kind of share that with you folks because uh, it leads into why the reach codes are, why they are, why we should consider having them. And despite the uh, ninth court circuit um, decision, what some jurisdictions are considering to still help meet some of these reach code, goal, reach code goals, despite not being able to enforce all electric and new construction, for example. Um, <clears throat> and that's it, Amen agenda, uh, the meeting adjourned at 310. So, can I move to um, approve the minutes from our May meeting? Certainly. Second. Yes, approved. Great. And let me just get back to my thing here. So we're moving right along. So our next topic, um, selection of a chair and a vice chair. I do want to just note the committee can officially operate with or without a chair and or a vice chair. It's in the best interest of the committee to have that so that we can have agenda setting meetings and you know just have a voice of the committee to be able to operate in that way. If we don't have one today and we establish one later, that's okay. Um, but it's ideally we would have someone um, become a chair or a vice chair. And given that we don't have Sunit today, it may be something you wanna look at for our next meeting, which isn't until September. I don't think we'll be crippled, but you, know, you guys can certainly take we'll action. <clears throat> Can we vote people in when they're not here? Um, <laughs> uh, Gregory, would you have any interest in being a chair this time? It's just for a year, right? It's a one-year appointment. Uh, no, I don't. I, 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 I better not. No. Okay, Ken. Not a chance. Not a chance. Okay. Um, why don't we check with Sunit? Maybe okay. she'd be interested in doing it for a year. Um, and um, and just see what she says. Okay. And plus, we have the open role of Minhui, so. Yeah. Uh, maybe someone else would be interested in or coming back. Maybe there's someone who used to be here who, I don't know. 
might be interesting. Do we have a list of people that have been on or are still around Atherton that we could go back and reach out to? Say that one more time Valerie for Gardner. me. Who? Valerie Gardner. Uh, Valerie was a while back. Valerie gave a presentation at the last night's meeting, which maybe we should share with them. Yeah, she gave to... a presentation on the state of uh, nuclear. Or... No, climate. it was on climate. Just oh, broader okay. climate. She had a really some really nice graphs and charts. She presented last night to uh, impromptu. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to pull that up when we get to maybe um, our goals discussion for everyone. She was one of the founding groups of this. <clears> that's long, right. Long, I'd be happy to reach out to Valerie and see if she has probably any interest. Probably gonna be a no because she's all about. I nuclear. think so. I think so. Uh, it's worth it to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Because she's all about nuclear power. Pardon me? You said because she's all about what? Nuclear. And why is that a no? Why would that be a no? no she's probably she, a no. She's probably going to say no because she's putting all of her effort into promoting that, yeah. next generation nuclear power. Okay. And what's her last name? Well, Valerie Gardner. She's Carson. also the one who just donated a sculpture to our yard last night. But. But right. She was one of the founders of the of, of our organization. She was involved in writing of the very first one of our documents. So that would be nice if we just reach out and say, "Would you be interested? We have an open position." Happy to do it. Okay, it's yeah. worth asking. I, I suspect the answer will be no. I asked her if she'd run for city council. She said no. So yeah. <laughs> I've had this conversation. I mentioned it to Anthony um, at the last. I didn't go last night for no reasons, so I don't know what happened last night. But at the meeting before that, the discussion was we don't have enough people applying for for committee members. And I guess my recommendation is we should go out to the guys who used to be committee members and say, why did you leave? And why wouldn't you come back? What are, what are the barriers to you to coming back or to be an aggressive promoter of the committee? Uh, and I don't, I have my own views of that, but I, I'd be nice to get the data from them. So Valerie, if she says no, other than I mean, spent all my life at nuclear, it'd be nice to know if there's any other reason. Yeah, I mean, I've had those conversations. I can't say I've had it with everybody that ever was a, a member of a committee. Typically, it falls into one of three buckets. I no longer have that time commitment to give. I've already given that amount of time, and I just don't have an interest in giving it again, especially when there's people like a Valerie who this wasn't a once a month type of activity for her, yeah. similar to. I think you folks, when you're planning for Earth Day, right? It's not a once, one meeting a month <laughs> opportunity. So I think at some point, a lot of people burn out, frankly. Um, and then there's a third thing that I do here back, whether I think it's totally valid or not. People are not entirely sure that the work that they do here bubbles up to the council or makes an impact on their community. And so those are, and it probably falls in like 12 different comments that I think fit into those those buckets, but to your point, I mean, it's not going to hurt us to reach out to all of our committee members and say, "Hey, can you give us some input on?" Um... And then the other side is, if there, if in one of them clearly is time, can we find a way to make that time fat easier? I don't know. Well, I don't know about that. Well, I mean, yeah. that's clearly the biggest problem. Well, let's do an email out to whoever was on our committee before mm -hmm. that's still in town and just say we're looking or do you have any suggestions? But if, happy to do I it. I mean, you, the reason why you don't want to run again is the time, correct? What's that woman, time Emily? Committee. She was really good. Sorry. Emily Kahn. Emily Kahn was yep. really good. She was good. I think she was considering, if I remember correctly, they were doing some type of development project outside of town. Not like she was moving, but she just was honest, and I don't think I have the time commitment to yeah. continue. Yeah, she was good. I would ask her again. Sure, sure. Yeah. I'll send out an email. I'll I'll uh, I'll um, provide an update to the committee members after do I do. We it. have a list of just all yeah. The old people we keep a list, a roster of current and past uh, committee members since I joined. I have that going back probably ten years. So it's not a hard thing to do. No, no, no. Okay. If their emails are still valid, that's you know another another point. Okay, so we'll we'll postpone any selection of a chair and a vice chair at this time, and we'll reach out to Sunit. Um, we'll also uh, do a little backdoor recruiting for our vacancy here. Well, before we move on, Amy, would you do it again? I was mentioning to Anthony earlier that if we don't have anybody, um, I don't want to be chairless. So I and now that Earth Day is being assumed by the staff, I think I would consider that, but I definitely want to give other people a chance. Okay. Fair Thank enough. you. Fair enough. Okay. So, so next we, we added this item on, um, for a few reasons. One, 
this group and the committee played an instrumental role in the concept of having a climate action plan from its inception. Um, we also want to just point the communities and the, uh, the committee's attention to our climate action dashboard, which has went through a recent round of updates based on some new data from the county consultants. Um, now, it's not brand new data in terms of um, it's not brand new data, but they reevaluated data that came from 2021. And with that reevaluation, they made some changes to the climate action dashboard. Um, a few of them I put in the pre-agenda notes that I can read through, but I'm gonna pull up the climate action dashboard on the screen so that we can just all be reintroduced to it to take a look at. And then maybe while Christabel is showing some of those changes that, that were made, we all, I'll skip through it so you guys can have kind of an interactive uh, feel for it. How do you get to it, Anthony? I didn't um, know how sure. to find it. So I'm, this is what I'll do. I'll share my screen. You had to do a search, meaning you had to know it existed, and you had to go to our website and say environmental dashboard. It, it isn't obvious where to find it on our website. That's fair. Um, let me, let me, I'm going to share my screen, sure. and then I'll take you through how I would do it, and then we can troubleshoot it uh, a bit. So I do have a question on the climate action plan on point. Two, I wanted to bring it to Gregory's attention as well. Gregory, do you have the email up with the um, the meetings? I think the notes, it's from 1134 this morning, right? Yeah. I just don't understand. And maybe Gregory, you would understand. It says that the total waste decreased, but the greenhouse gas emissions rose in 2021. So Christabel is prepared to talk a bit about that. We oh, some, okay. Yeah, we had some meetings not only with the Rincon consultants who reevaluated the data, but also with Green Waste Recovery, and we're prepared to kind of walk through why. That oh, okay, shows. great. Yeah. Um, so here's the website. This right here, this common service request buttons. If you guys think it valuable, so these these things, this is just website stuff. These things were the top choices based on our data on the back end of the the um, website that people access. So that's why these were the common service quest choices. I have played around with changing these Aircraft at different noise? times. People, Aircraft noise. We, we, when I first started here, <laughs> just before COVID, we would get a weekly email from the San Carlos airport. And it was like the, one of the number one complaints people would call about because they felt like the planes were riding too close to their homes and it bothered them. But to your point, maybe we throw a climate action plan right here and it's a quick button. But right now, yeah, you can either use this search icon here uh, or you can go to our committee, our environmental programs committee deal um, page. If I can scroll down and climate action dashboard is going to be right here. Check out the dashboard. How many calls to action do you have at the top, Anthony, at the top of the page, if you scroll to the top of the homepage? Uh, let's go back to the home. I think the, the common service request thing? If you go scroll, um, just so we can see the very top of the page, the top of the scroll. So your only call to action is search. Right. Yeah. So I suggest considering adding a call to action up at the top. That's usually what you have on a website. Like um, maybe it could be check out the climate action plan or check. Out, usually you have at least one call to action up there. Could we brainstorm that or could the summer interns look at that? We, we, we can take a look at that. Okay. Because that would be kind of a cool place to have the climate action plan, check out our new climate action plan. And then in a yellow button, that way people who are on the website would look, you know what I mean? We could even add periodically like these scrolling images. We can add a graphic that calls people to check out our dashboard and it's a hyperlink that they can yeah, click on. Yeah, that's it. a great idea. It We've could done, be When we first launched scrolls. it, we had that there. Oh, you did? We okay. did. I mean, these things get stale, so we try to refresh no, them. No, I understand. I was just thinking it's kind of a neat, um, I know they have a lot on their plate, but something for the interns this summer because they could look at other towns and see what call to actions they have at the top. Okay. Yeah, we can take a look at that. So let's get back to the um, climate action dashboard. I'm just going to skip ahead to take a look at it. And so this is this is the dashboard. So this is our climate action plan built into a website that's interactive, right? So um I'll review it and you just let me know when you're ready to, to get going with the updates. Um, so, Especially when we have all the background news. 
we have a climate action plan because it's a legal requirement or the town wants to do it or both? It's not a legal requirement. The town wants to do it and the committee uh, supported it and the council supported yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, so it's not a legal requirement. But aren't there county and statewide um, climate or greenhouse gas emission targets set for 2040 that yes. we wouldn't be able to account for it at the San Mateo County level if we weren't able to capture it, correct? We wouldn't be able to monitor it without an actual plan in action. Yeah. So that I think that's what the, I wasn't here for the conversation about the climate action plan, but I think that the plan was implemented to help us keep track with those numbers. Okay. Yeah, but it's not a legal requirement the way that like a general plan is a legal requirement. So, so um, this is this is the dashboard. These are the uh, primary categories. There's six: climate change, building energy, transportation, solid waste, carbon sequestration, and water use, and then um, understanding our consumption. Um, and Christabel, if you want to take it away, we're, we're we're planning to just talk about the updates that were recently made. And if we want to get into more detail, we can do that. I would recommend we consider that at another meeting because we do have a variety of other things we want to provide updates on today. Yes. So I think throughout the dashboard, there were mostly like text updates or number updates. I think the most significant ones are the ones shown in your summary of the dashboard updates. Those are the three points. Um, the second point that you called out, Amy. Um, so I'll highlight those three points. The first one is the VMT in Atherton. So, so it's vehicle miles traveled. Yes, sorry, vehicle miles traveled VMT in Atherton. That was a notable change um, where our VMT was recognized as 20%, uh, 20, sorry, 27% of our greenhouse gas emissions. How do we know that? It's data that we get from San Mateo County. But how do they know? They pull this data from the DMV and other transportation data points from the state. They know. How do they know how many travel, miles are actually traveled in Atherton? How does anybody know that? I can't, I can't answer that right now, but I could bring a consultant in to help provide some. But I mean, it's a I, metric that they use in a lot of things, and yeah. I don't know how they get it. That's but my it's, point. It's in a lot of stuff. All the transportation all meetings just, talk about it. So I, I just, I just someone's that. figured I got, out how to do it in the but, chain. But, but is it real? Is I, wonder, I wonder if it's based on the address where the car is registered. Because I think when you register your vehicle with a DMV, right? Well, you put your address and you put if you're using it for commercial or, or personal purposes. Yeah, so I know for a fact that it comes from the DMV. Okay. Part of it, and I know some of it. Some of the other data comes from the state sustainability department because the jurisdictions have to report um, the number of households, the number of cars, things like that. Um, how it actually gets calculated, I don't want to misspeak and and give but you information they're, they're that I can't answer. Incredible efforts on numbers which may not be right. So and we're not the only agency that I don't, that. But I don't, they can be wrong. I don't. Fair, fair. We we could definitely. either get distracted and no, do no, that, or we can talk about it's the. It's not a distraction. Either have data that is right or don't use it. I can't say that the data is wrong. The San, the San Mateo County Office of Sustainability uses the data, and we rely on it. Maybe we could have someone come from the San Mateo County Office of Sustainability and present to oh, us. I'm sorry. They asked us, okay? So they yeah. sent me an email asking, remember, Christabel, yeah. if they, they wanted to come and do a presentation to staff and anyone who's interested. So right. this yeah. was an item I was going to bring up and see Let's if do we, it. Can, yeah. we can do that and have them come to all of us. And, and, and we could even me. open it up. It could be part of our education outreach. We could open up to everybody if you're interested in the county level. This is what they do. This is what, you know, your tax dollars are supporting it, right? Yep. So, okay. It's totally possible. They reached out to me over two months ago. And wow. we really are cool. overdue to respond back and set I'll that up. Do so. um, I just wanted to provide verbatim, like an answer to your question, Ken. We do receive an inventory toolkit or essentially our data, our numbers. Um, not necessarily to approve, but hey, take a look at your town's greenhouse gas emission data that we've produced for you. Um, so in that packet, it does say, that this greenhouse gas inventory was developed through the San Mateo County Energy Watch Program, funded by California utility customers, administered by the Pacific Gas and Electric Company, pg and &E, under the auspices of the California Public Utilities Commission, and with matching funds provided by CCAG. That tells me who paid for it. Doesn't tell me how they did it. Right. Well, we can how have them come in. Do. Maybe we can. Yeah, yeah their methodology. I'm not, we can't speak yeah. to that, but those were the responsible parties no, 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 for no, putting this toolkit I'm together. Saying, but we, yeah. How do they know how many miles to put on my car? 
Yeah. How many miles does construction yeah. guys do? It's, Where's that number coming I, from? I do know this. It's not exact, Ken. They, uh, they, yeah. use, they use a lot of assumptions, like with most models, and I know you're yeah, familiar sure, with yeah. models. Mine are more financial models, but they use a lot of assumptions based on historic outputs and, and outcomes. All I'm saying is I'd like yeah. to see those assumptions. Sure. Well, we're basing, we're basing some things that will affect our, our, our residents on assumptions. We should know what the assumptions are. All right, well, we agreed we'll, yeah, we'll take we'll them, them up on their offer to present to us. All right, let's keep going. Okay, um, the second notable change was the GHGs that you called out, Amy. Um, Anthony, if you could go to the waste disposal category. There was a significant change for the GHGs. So we go, yeah, waste and atherton. And then scroll down. It's numbers after we switch to our new vendor because our new vendor changes the change significantly the way they they deal with organic waste. Because if you guys remember, we used to have an organic waste thing and we Correct. had to put the yes. organic waste. And then they said, oh, you no longer need to do it. We're doing it all. So Correct. And it was all, it was counterintuitive when that happened. Right. It was like, what are you talking about? We're going back. These numbers now. are 2021 numbers. And so we changed over in maybe late 2021, I think 2022, maybe. And this is what the numbers are reflecting. Is their different way of processing organic N waste? Not yet. So these numbers don't have. This is before that. Correct. So these numbers are before the change. That's right. Now there's other numbers that our refuse and recycling committee received. That's public information that provides us data on our diversion rates that green waste does contribute to. And so what, um, what the mayor is talking about is the fact that we have our three bins. We were, the town used to put food scraps in your compost bin, but SB 1383 now asks that, um, jurisdictions not include food scraps in those those bins to produce a higher grade compost and we actually benefit from that because we now have our food scraps put in our gray can they sort that out at the facility to the best of their ability but there is and this is a part of what Chris Bell is going to go into it some of it now ends up in landfill and so that has increased our GHD emissions slightly but on the other side of it, we're able to produce a higher quality compost that can be used for, excuse me, hello, that can be used for organic um, gardening, compost, it can be sold to agriculture. And so we, we use that now. So she'll dig into it, that a little bit more, but that's not reflected in these numbers here. That's not reflected because that's an interesting thing for us to track going forward as to whether that was the right decision or not. And, uh, it did help us comply with this, the laws that came about, but it was counterintuitive from a resident's perspective of what we were asking them to do. And I did go and visit the facility and it's very impressive, but I don't know what the net net is of that change. So as you guys follow this going forward, yep. that's an important thing to track. And we, we actually, so there's a variety of reports that we have to send to CalRecycle um, that will include those diversion rates and how it ties into and impacts our overall GHG, GHG emission numbers. And we certainly will be reporting that. So where, and again, where do the numbers come from? How they, how they created? Which numbers? The number you said are GHC, how do they find those? Those come from um, the data that provided to the county and CalRecycle. Um, and they're required to submit to CalRecycle, which is through the county. This is green waste. Aspect. Yes. The facility reports on waste collected, tonnage, um, the categories of it, and how it's distributed so, or used. So we're, we're being judged on what they collect from us? How, what they collect, how we sort it, how we basically deal with it, um, is what we report out. And so if you scroll down just a little bit where it says our waste production in 2019 was our worst since the 205 baseline, um, and then you were going to explain the difference of why the greenhouse gas. So, so here, I think if you scroll down a little bit, I think it was this one, the emissions from disposed waste. This is point number two, where we sent less waste to the landfill, but there was actually a higher emission from that waste, which when you send a reduction of waste, you're also expecting a reduction of GHGs or greenhouse gas emissions. Here, what I, our data is saying is, yes, we did send less waste to the landfill, but 
in that waste, we also found more organic matter. So that's where they, that's where the number, they don't, they don't, it's kind of a surrogate for what it is. They, we said less waste, but then it was more organic matter. Correct. Is that it? Yes. They measure, so they the way. They measure the numbers. They, they do it by that? some shorthand. They don't really measure the exact numbers of what we sent and what, it, what came out of our waste. They don't, they can't measure all that, obviously, because it's all mixed together. So basically what they do is they say, you said X pounds of total waste and mm -hmm. why, why of that was organic. The more organic you send, the more emissions you're getting. Yes. So how do we fix that problem? Well, this is where my analysis, I was kind of asking Anthony the same thing. Um, I reached out to Green Waste kind of to help understand. Um, we do have Green Waste quarterly reports, which I don't think was included in this packet, but no. I could share it with you. Um, green Waste in their quarterly reports show the diversion rates for our green bins. And I looked at the diversion rates for our green bins, which is where we usually collected organic matter, food or compost. Um, and those are probably primarily landscape chippings because they're diverted at a 99% rate, I think it was, 97 or 99, I'll follow up and confirm, it's very crazy. high percentage. Um, and because of that, we're no longer putting organic matter or food in the green bins because it would spoil the landscape chippings that have that 99% diversion rate. So in order to do that, we're now putting the food in the waste bins and green waste facility at their facility, they remove the organic or the organic matter or food from the waste hand sorted. However, they can't catch all of it. And so that's why there's going to be more food sent to the landfill, but we are having a 99% diversion rate of our green bins with the landscape chippings. So in a way, it's kind of, I, I don't know how to explain. It's like picking one battle for the other. Yeah, it's, we've, we've, to get in compliance with SB 1383, which was one of our pivotal reasons for moving from ecology over to green waste, besides the commercial facility that Recology was building that we didn't want to contribute toward. <laughs> we, their method to help us get to this higher diversion rate um, is to separate how we handle and deal with our food scraps. And that's by using green cans for yard trimmings exclusively and taking food scraps and putting them into the the gray cans. And then the, because of their sorting practices in their facility that not all facilities have, I guess, the capabilities of doing that. They use robots, they use um, people, um, and they have a few other um, like machinery that can sort things out based on size and shape of that particular matter, material. Is there and, a way to ask the question if we were, I, I think that the green bin, having it being just grass and yard waste is is brilliant but we took away the kitchen scrap. Now, mind you, that's a very small number of people who actually did it, but do, do they, can we ask them what they think the benefit would be to add back a kitchen scrap thing, you know, whatever you call it, so that those who do choose to do kitchen scrap that's pure organic coming from your kitchen, if that's processed separately, could we then affect this number? And then is that something that's ridiculously out of the range of what they could do? But looking at where we go forward, maybe we could recommend that to or residents. On that point, do we, it does the quarterly report show the tons, the number of tons in yard waste? Yes. Because if we look at that versus what goes to landfill, I have a feeling it's much, much larger, right? And if 99% of it is actually being diverted from the landfill, the vast majority of our waste is not going to landfill. Then we have the recycle bins. So the black bin, which does include organic waste, I'd be interested to know what the tonnage of that is, because that's got to be quite small compared to the green bins and the recycle bin. We certainly can take the time to pull up that report now, or if you'd like, oh, we no, can maybe share that next out. time. Yeah, yeah whatever. Uh, I just think I, I'm just curious um, on a couple of points. I know we're going to come to this later, but the four biggest in terms of landmass and number of individuals contributors to a lot of activity are Sacred Heart, Menlo College, Menlo School, and Circus Club. Yeah, and so um, if we want to address the largest, those that have the largest impact, which yeah, we can come to right. later, I think we address that. So if we could do a deeper dive on their waste, yeah. it could be very interesting because if we look quickly at the number of students at Sacred Heart, I know Menlo College has about 900 students. I think Sacred Heart has a little over a thousand students. Um, that's a lot of organic waste 
every day throughout the academic year that's getting put into the regular bins. So tackling that would be, I have think would have a bigger dent than if we did individuals, right? So maybe we brainstorm how we could get that data on those four large- so not making more organic waste, but we're counting it differently. Is that what's happening? Or are we having more? Again? It's going into different streams. Yeah, the land, but, the stuff from the from the the yard is not going to landfill. No, no, I understand that. Right. But I mean, Please. but as far as the garbage stuff we're doing, and are we are we always saying we're throwing more stuff out than we did before? No, so it's just reallocation. It's right. just uh, it's just that the organic waste from your table that used to go into the the green bins right. now goes into the black bin, right. and plenty of people. We'll leave it in plastic bags. Like, oh, I have a bag of lettuce from Trader Joe's. I'm not going to finish. They just chuck it in there. And then if the machine doesn't scrape it apart, that break that bag to get the organic matter out, then that are organic. Do you know what I mean? Like it's going to go into the... So, but again, households versus those, even if we looked at the three schools... And even if we looked at how many children or young adults at Menlo College, how much waste each of them produces a day throughout the academic year, it's got to be way bigger. Especially cafeterias. I think yes. you're onto something there. That if you if you get to the separating organic waste, especially if it's at a kitchen like a cafeteria, maybe that would be a worthwhile program to recommend. And that the schools may even, even take it on themselves. <laughs> Out of, yeah, you know, and in full disclosure, I introduced Menlo College. I'm not getting any compensation or anything. I introduced Menlo College to a San Mateo-based company called Mill, and they take organic waste. We talked about that. No, no, it's, I'm just yeah. bringing, I'm looking at your new dress. Okay, yeah. They, how you afford the new dress. Oh, <laughs> no, I had the dress before. Okay. Um, they take, they take uh, organic waste and they put it in this... Um, composter style oh, thing yeah. that we talked about. Yeah, yeah. And so Menlo College, I think, is considering, or Sodexo, trying it in the kitchen. They wouldn't put it, recommend putting it in the cafeterias because too many students throw forks, plates, and everything into the bin accidentally. Yeah. And so that would potentially break the machine. So they were just going to do, I don't know if they've decided to do that, but you know, it could be interesting. We go to all the schools and say, would this be something you would consider? Because then it takes that waste and turns it into chicken food. So it goes away totally from the recycling. Yes. And... Awesome. Love it. That would cut down whatever that number is, right? <clears throat> um, At Earth Day, we had a vendor that had a similar product, Lasso or something like Lasso that. Lasso Loop, yeah. Um, did you look at the two of them? Are they comparable or... I didn't look at them yet. I had just heard about this one, and um, but I think we could look at both and just say this we could try awesome them all. This would be an intern thing. Go and yeah. look at these two companies and get back to us on how they compare. And then if there's one that we would highly recommend, then maybe we could, uh, if there's interest, get yeah. the schools to look at that. But that getting that organic waste and understanding, you know, because we made a decision as a city to move away from those scraps and it's a good decision i don't think it's bad because the goal is clean you know the numbers it makes sense yeah to, but i don't know if financially over time it makes sense to bring back some of the separating and like you said maybe going to the specific bigger places where they're producing more trash maybe that's have a bigger, oh, yeah. Start. A bigger impact yeah, yeah. Um, but and like we to... haven't even talked about ma that's so true. ma three thousand kids the challenge with ma is that they don't use green waste, they use recology. They use recology? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they use Even recology. though they're in the public but schools. We still get counted for them, don't we? Oh, they probably have a contract, right? So yeah, the Union public schools. Oh, so they're, they're counted in our numbers, though. No. So they're not. They're not served by green waste recovery. So so these numbers you're showing us don't involve MA? Uh, 